So I would also Uh, Daniel van der Velden Winkelkrook from of Metahaven, um, who we I met 2010, um, and for whom been, been re absolutely essential collaborators uh, e ever since in, in projects, but also in, in in thinking about what really matters most in the world and how that becomes can and cannot become design one way or another. So anyway, I thank you all very much for taking the time and joining us here today, but also for um, the, your participation in the, in the project at large. And so, um, let me introduce the first project that we'll be looking at, that we'll be uh, looking at today. All of our projects uh, that we do here at Strelka are based in Russia and also based on Russia. And usually this means uh, more or less the same thing. Uh, but not always. Russia is, in a way, in the land or on the land of Russia, the ground, the lakes, the fields, the asphalt, but Russia is also a nation, one that has, of course, a more recent history than the ground on which it sits. So our first and last projects, the one we'll be seeing tomorrow, um, bookend, in a way, the dynamic between the two, the, the nation in the land and the land as the nation. Our first project goes all the way down in the stack to the physical substance of that part of the earth that is the physical Russia. It considers that land and what lies just beneath, in and above it, as a kind of metabolism. Energy comes forth, energy is subsumed back in, or it should be. In the 1940s, George Bataille, the French philosopher, developed a radical theory of economy that had considerable influence on European thought throughout the 20th century. He turned his head up to the solar orifice in the sky from which a blinding abundance of energy pours forth and identified the first primordial economy, the open-ended expenditure of absolute surplus of light and heat. The world itself is an economy of physical energy. So following from Max Weber's uh, history on the origins of capitalism, Bataille contrasted this open economy with what he called a restricted economy of the modern state for which energy is produced, but then always recaptured, restored, reinvested in a claustrophobic loop. For him, ethics meant to open that loop. 
However, in the early 20th century, we might see things the other way around. We extract energy from the ground and extinguish it with spastic fury. As you tap your foot at the gas pump, waiting for the tank to fill, you're moving more condensed energy in a couple of minutes than your ancestors captured in a lifetime. Food, too, is energy storage. We make crops by pharmaceutical terraforming of, of wheat and glucose absorption. The land does not burn quite as bright as the sun, but that's not for our lack of trying. Indeed, the world itself is an economy of energy. The economy doesn't flow on top of the world, but as the world, circulating and burning itself. Physical energy is stored in matter. We find it, we explode it, and then over time, it's reabsorbed or isn't. In essence, we've come to understand that territory is a medium of energy storage. Territory is a battery. In the flux and flows of energy that it mediates, territory is the physical site of a real economy. Territory equals battery equals economy. And yet now, this metabolism is an open loop. The land cannot reabsorb, and so we need to close the loop. But how? And at what scale? Vault. I'm Sofia Pia Belenki. I'm from New York. I'm an architect. Hi, my name is Alona. I'm from Russia, Kurchatov. Hi, my name is Ksenia. I'm an architect from Moscow. Hi, my name is Don. I'm an architect from Sweden. So, this is first and foremost a film about the landscape of Russia. As a point of, as a point of entry into the discussion, uh, we broadened the definition of landscape um, to be, as Benjamin was just saying now, a territory, a battery, and an economy. The territory is a physical construct with latent potential energies that form a new model of economy. How has this landscape been shaped historically, which has led to its expenditure? In order to understand this site, we propose a simple lens through which to see the territory. We refract landscape as two entities. The landscape is simultaneously constructed through framing and forming. The ideology and representation of landscape reflects its use and its value. In turn, this formation reinforces and reshapes our understanding of it. Uh, so, uh, ideologies, ideas, and the representation in the way, uh, uh, frame the way we see and understand the landscape. And um, uh, the landscape uh, materiality is formed by uh, the physical surface and how, uh, uh, and how it uh, manifests itself, uh, uh, manifests itself in the real time. It is an actual real uh, landscape. Um. The horizontal cartography draw the borders in two dimensions uh, and in the context and uh, in history of Russia we looked at the uh, territory of abandoned resources and energies and we considered how uh, ideology of extraction based on uh, uh, 
based on static understanding of the land has uh, led to uh, terminal uh, to territorial landscape project of extraction and uh, this lands landscape is something uh, that is under uh, under us and is uh, uh, meant to be modified uh, uh, commodified and transformed by us So if ideology of extraction and uh, economic model of open loop uh, creates the landscapes that we see now, how we can change this, how we can close this, op uh, this open loop? Maybe by volumetric cartography. Sorry. Uh, so what we call vault in this volumetric um, cartography is an enclosed volume of expanded energy, storage, harvesting, and capture that is extracted and extended from the surface of its borders down to the subterranean realm. The territory is now constituting the largest sovereign body on Earth. Here, Vault reframes the landscape and proposes an alternative Russian terraforming and terraframing um, ambition. It's a string of inputs ranging from hyperspectral imagery, LIDAR, real-time soil, air, and water monitoring. The Vault is revealed and rendered operational. The project speculates on this composition of a new landscape and how to close this open loop of energy extraction and expenditure. Thank you. Ландшафт — это хранилище энергии. Это аккумулятор, гигантская батарейка, тераджоули, калории, киловатт-часы извлечены из недр. Эта экономика основана на непрерывной добыче и расходовании энергии. Система постоянных потоков провоцирует постоянный рост. Красные реки. Красная земля. Добычу энергии не остановить. Каждый преследует свои собственные интересы. Горы превращаются в карьеры. Поля превращаются в пастбище. Минералы плавятся, превращаются в металл. Металл срезает пшеницу. Пшеница берет углеводы из почвы. Углеводы превращаются в жировые клетки, универсальную биологическую батарейку. Культура превращает природу в ресурс, потребляя кусок за куском. Хлеб поднимается. Пол 
плоская картография определяет мышление и модель управления. Земля измерена плугом. Расстояние определено энергией. Почва спахана. Реки повернуты вспять. Там, где была вода, теперь пустыня. Там, где были горы, теперь равнина. Рельеф изменен трудом человека. Цикл потребления формирует пейзаж. Почва истощена. Плодородность определяет стоимость. Минералы дают название городам. Такая экономика недолгосрочна. Такой ландшафт конечен. Четыре климатических пояса, 64 тысячи километров границ. 11 часовых поясов. Леса, горы, реки, нефть, углекислый газ. Энергия высвобождается. Границы уходят вглубь земли. Территория приобретает новый объем. Города, леса, тундра, почва, ископаемые, нижняя кора, мантия, ядро. Это не часть экономики. Это новая форма экономики. Энергия выходит на поверхность, определяя новую модель экономики, новый ландшафт. Круговорот метаболизма запускается. Все, что было получено из ландшафта, возвращается обратно. Плоть возвращается в землю. Почва рождает новую жизнь. Минералы, пища, вода, углерод. Все возвращается в землю. Экономика возобновляет ландшафт. В 
батарея, батарея перезаряжается. перезаряжается. Технологии меняют значение территории. Раньше вода утоляла жажду, теперь она производит энергию. Новый ландшафт – это синтез природы и технологии. Масштаб территории позволяет увидеть несовершенство существующей системы. Ландшафт миллиардов деревьев. Планктон создает новую атмосферу под водой. Топливо теперь над землей, а не под ней. Силикатные породы удерживают частицы воздуха. Почва снова плодородна. Новые черные углеродные горы. Земля делает вдох. Новое понимание территории формирует новый ландшафт. We're good. Okay. Thank you. So, guess what? With Vault, uh, we saw uh, one particular model uh, of the, how to see the landscape, how seeing the landscape through particular models uh, makes certain kinds of economies seemingly necessary. But more generally, we don't only have conceptual models. We also externalize models into artifacts which in turn train our conceptual models. Especially in the last two years, a recurring interest in our program has been in how design uses models and how models in turn design what it is that they model. And this recursion has, is most explicit, perhaps, with complex computational simulations. Financial markets, for example, are themselves intricate simulations of what flows of value are most likely, and hence the real economy we saw in the, in the vault becomes a model of itself. But as Donald McKenzie 
puts it, financial markets are really more an engine than a camera. They help generate what they describe by setting the terms of what is and is not a calculable risk. Today, more broadly, these simulations are used to train AIs in how to do things in the real world by having them first master the virtual ones. And as you'll see, large companies maintain, for example, digital twins of their complex machines, such as jet engines, that mirror the real-time performance of the original. Now, that's okay, if a, but what if a simulated problem space, like a city, needs to be modeled by many different actors at once? none of which can know everything that they need to know about all the variables, but all of which of these actors need to know answers that depend on what the others know. What if the division of cognition between these actors, some governments, some companies, some scientists, isn't really the ideal way of dividing up the problem and ends up causing more confusion? Our next project, Sybil, suggests one possible answer. Less an AI gym than a kind of open stadium for multivariable simulations to interact with one another. It would make computational simulations more open, available, and powerful way of knowing and designing. Lastly, this project may, at, at first glance, seem the, quite technical compared to the last, but is also in the best possible sense, perhaps the most utopian of the projects that you'll see today. So, my pleasure to welcome Sybil. Hello, my name is Ricardo. I'm a designer from Brazil. Hello, I'm uh, Gregory. I'm a computer vision engineer from Moscow. Hi, my name is Maria Fyodorova. I'm an architect and artist from Moscow. Hi, my name is Mark Wilcox. I'm a software strategist from New Zealand. And uh, we're going to play a video, introduce you to a software concept called Sybil. And it's an open platform for enabling simulations across domains. High performance computing is the, is the engine enabling almost all modern, modern science, science technology, technology and consumer product, product breakthroughs. Simulations, Simulations enable, enable us to extend beyond our basic working memory to design, to design and build systems whose, whose complexity would be otherwise unfathomable. Today, Today simulations, simulations are trusted as digital, digital twins to directly, to directly manage the operation of complex mechanical systems. systems. A digital, a digital twin is a virtual, virtual representation of the elements and dynamics of an IoT device, device and, the and the environment around it. A twin, a twin becomes, becomes intelligent, not, not just by capturing, capturing the data, data but, by but by processing it through powerful algorithms that learn and grow in tandem with the physical entity. Our dependence on computer modeling only increases as real-time data demands reach new heights with 5G data networks. So the esoteric language of scientific computing needs to be transformed and needs to come out of university basements, government agencies and corporate R&D labs into global networks where we can observe, evolve and govern them in the future. Despite, Despite major advances in digital, digital modeling, modeling, render engines, and AI methods, methods the, current the current architecture of simulations isn't, isn't able to incorporate the dynamics of an increasingly complex world. The limitations lie both in the lack of common formats that support the integration of simulation modules across different platforms, as well as the computing power necessary for large-scale simulations with overlapping domains. 
there exists a virtuous cycle in AI research in which the development of novel environments can enable the development of novel algorithms and vice versa. This effect can be seen in how games in AI have been intertwined. In a similar way, the ability of researchers to create complex environments that mimic the conditions found in the real world can lead to physical spaces through which new simulation techniques can emerge. By applying the same thought process to simulation spaces, we can begin to build a picture of a meta-modeling environment where engines and algorithms can be combined, multiplied and averaged. The use of game engines as simulation platforms for autonomous vehicles points to the necessity of a networked platform that is able to support the instantiation of complex systems with real-time data, such as traffic and pedestrian activity in the city. Game engines offer a high level of modularity, but their architecture can't scale to the growing demand for complex simulations because of their core role as a general simulation environment that only runs on one computer. The creation of an open simulation platform could rapidly increase the potential the simulations could play in the near future. These environments need to be much more sophisticated than what you would build in a game. They need to be able to ingest the real-time data for entire supply chains and ecosystems at ever-decreasing timescales. Sybil is a collaborative and modular programming environment that connects previously isolated computational models in one simulation space. Sybil extends popular programming and simulation engines by introducing a modular ecosystem where simulation models can be combined, increasing their resolution, accuracy and dynamic complexity. Designed around an intermediate format, Sybil displays commonalities between packages, establishing a link between different engines, and augmenting the standalone software architecture paradigm. This enables real-time investigation of events within a simulation, while also producing high-precision datasets for downstream applications, such as machine learning and computer vision. By introducing an open format, the platform links data markets across different disciplines, the simulation tools and engines already available on the market. As different applications are chained together, changes are registered into a common reference model, converging into the same simulation space. Sybil is designed to simplify the modeling of complex systems facilitate the integration of different simulation engines and, and enable interactions across different scales and domains. Simulations are run in an open environment, enabling different experts across organizations to work together in real time. This means that simulations can achieve higher complexity without sacrificing resolution in any one application. Sybil introduces universal visual programming, bridging existing modeling and rendering packages across disciplines, making it easier for experts to work together. 
Simulations in Civil operate with an overlap in address spaces, which enable them to interact with each other, sharing data and adjusting their predictive models. Civil's real-time data markets allow for the sharing and licensing of models, datasets, real-time feeds and visualizations. From the car companies to urban designers, insurance agents, and traffic engineers, simulations enable different actors to better understand how different policies might change the urban landscape. While achieving a high level of resolution within themselves, these simulations remain largely isolated from each other. Sybil's real-time open market enables multiple organizations to run their models in the 5G infrastructure allowing them to interact while keeping control of individual parts. The result is an emergent multi-stakeholder modeling environment that better captures the complexity present in real-world systems. In this new simulated space, policies, urban infrastructure, software and hardware development become linked by their common interdependencies, being able to react to changing demands. Sybil becomes a meta-modeling application able to monitor a recursion between simulations on different scales. The platform makes it possible to build reconstructed models of events that happened in the past, tracing their interconnecting dynamics across timescales, providing data for analytics and future prediction. For instance, Sybil makes possible a multi-scale modeling of epidemiology, plugging together simulations of contagious transmission from molecular level through the human body and into the city, tracing how the disease can be spread via air travel. Such approach helps to reveal feedback loops between simulations and unlocks recursion between scales. How the, how the molecular, molecular level impacts, impacts the city, and how the city level reflects back in the molecular. When the control and reasoning over the functioning of infrastructure moves to a simulation environment, the distinction between the physical and virtual changes to a new configuration. One that prioritizes the digital as a constant object, while the physical is in a perpetual state of update and optimization. By creating a space for the integration of digital twins of complex real-world systems, their digital models can begin to co-evolve, reshaping how they're conceived. In this model, a digital twin is able to integrate and optimize for interactions, actors, and environments that run beyond its scale and domain. As powerful a tool as computer modeling is, it's no replacement for the real world. We need to constantly reconcile our models with reality, or our models will redefine us.
Okay, we're back. So as we, uh, as we saw in the previous project uh, in Sybil, the, the, the role that simulations play in how we govern the world is increasingly central, but they are not the only kind of model that governance uses. Legal models and the algorithmic if-then logic of a legal framework is another. And so too, models need not only be derived from the past, they can also anticipate the future. The object of legal governance may also may not only be people, it may also be the world itself, its ecosystems. That is, we must consider not only how existing governing models can administer, for example, a bioregion, as in the case of our next project, but how the governance of bioregions may emerge as a new sovereign layer within a wider framework. It's said that sovereignty uh, is held not by who rules according to the law, but by he or she or it who may declare a state of emergency in which the law is suspended until further notice. At the same time, an emergency can also produce new forms of sovereignty that emerge from that crisis. The redrawing of maps of the former Soviet regions in the 1990s is one such example. So for the next project, Mira, we will see this dynamic at work in relation to two different models of the future. One of, of, the, of the future of the bioregion around the Caspian Sea. First, ecological forecasts that predict the collapse of ecological viability in the coming decades. And second, a plan for a preemptive jurisdiction that would address present and anticipated problems. The shift from a, 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 the governance of the general will of humans to the governance of the material reality upon which life depends seems likely in our near future for good or ill. It may work less because it, less because it would speak to the better angels of the participant cities than because it would better align their own actual self-interests of survival in relation to an underlying unnegotiable material reality of land, air, and sea that is finally indifferent to human narratives. Mira. Hello. My Hello again, my name is Evgenia. I'm lawyer and project manager from Russia. Uh, hello, my name is Olga Chernikova. I'm an architect from Russia. Hi, my name is Antonia. I'm an urban management consultant from Canada. Hi, my name is Nishin. I'm an architect from Indonesia. My name is Nabi. I'm from Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and I'm an architect and urban designer. Um, when we think of territories, we usually tend to imagine borders, lines that we draw on maps. Those lines, uh, they react to geographies and topographies, political tensions, and sometimes political <clears throat> conflicts. Uh, those lines both tend to include and exclude people and resources. But what are the what is the role of borders and boundaries today in the face of um, ecological crises? Mera is trying to address three uh, issues with the um, current situation. 
So these are um, the fragmented jurisdiction um, and fragmented governance of ecological bodies whose systems often extend far beyond any one uh, nation state and this misalignment making it difficult to make um, coordinated decisions. Um, and the next one is short-term thinking and um, micro scales of human perception of time that often remain disconnected from not only the longer time scales of geological systems, but also their dynamic flows and processes. And finally, the misalignment of um, political, economic, and ecological interests that have fueled activities that uh, have resulted in the overexploitation of natural resources. As the ecological crisis begins to shed light on the limits of our current system, we are re-led uh, to think how to reconceptualize our jurisdictional systems and administrations. Bioregionalism argues that human activity be coordinated with ecological and biological processes rather than political ones. Typically, the boundary of the bioregion is defined around the watershed. Uh, which reveals the geographical limits of human communities and uh, ecological systems. But what if the governance system would be based on the logics of the watershed and taking into account the ramifications of geological processes? Miara proposes a new sovereign layer aligned to the logic of watershed. It speculates on the governance of the Caspian region, exploring its past, present, and potential futures. Miera. Political boundaries and ecological systems follow distinct and often contradictory logics. Boundaries can contain resources, but also expel and ban. Other times, they are shaped by political conflict. Yet, a static line is ignored by the fluxes of a river over time. These inconsistencies can have high cost, the sea becoming a desert. The fate of the Aral Sea serves as a prime example of an ecological disaster caused by human activity as a result of fragmented jurisdictions, short-term thinking and misaligned incentives. The pollution that once flowed through its rivers became exposed dust on the dried up seabed carried by salinated dust storms affecting other regions. However, there are a number of successful examples that seek to manage cross-border ecological systems. The Danube River covers more than 10% of continental Europe, making it one of the most international river basins. The Danube River Protection Convention was signed by 14 basin countries and the European Union as contracting parties. It forms the legal instrument for cooperation and transboundary water management of the basin. It seeks to manage it as a natural geographical and hydrological unit rather than through administrative boundaries. The topography of Bali creates a condition where farmers in upstream and downstream fields must coordinate the distribution of water in order to control pest populations. 
if water is withheld in the upstream fields, pressed from downstream, can migrate upstream. To align social and ecological interests, administrative boundaries are based on water basins and follow seasonal logics of temporal governance. The Coral Triangle is the epicenter of marine life. Its diversity and economic value are threatened by climate change, urbanization and overfishing, among other impacts. Coral Triangle Initiative is a multilateral partnership between the six countries formed to coherently address the urgent threats facing the ecosystem and align business interests to ecological concerns. Despite these practices of integrated water management models, they remain subordinate to administrative jurisdictions. MIRA proposes a new sovereign system based on the logic of watersheds. The MERA boundary is defined by the extent of our watershed, which incorporates territories and cities from distinct administrative borders under its jurisdiction. The cities within the new jurisdiction form the MERA city union to govern the new boundaries. MERA is granted the legal basis for sovereignty under an agreement signed by the union. MIRA is a feasible model for the governance of ecosystems prone to disputed resources and contested territory, for which Caspian Sea is an ideal scenario. Until 1991, the Caspian Sea was governed technically as a lake through bilateral agreements between the Soviet Union and Iran. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet portion was subdivided into four parts, and today the Caspian Sea is bordered by five distinct littoral states. The Caspian Sea shares the characteristics common to both sea and lake, and this ambiguity creates a number of economic, military, and political, as well as environmental complications. If it was recognized as a lake, its surface and seabed would be equally divided between bordering countries. Under the classification of the Caspian Sea as a sea, each littoral state would have a territorial waters of up to 12 nautical miles, an exclusive economic zone set on median line, and a continental shelf. In 2018, a mutual agreement granted the Caspian Sea a special legal status, determining it as neither sea nor lake. Each of the five countries have been granted 15 miles of sovereign waters and an additional 10 miles of fishing space. Yet the division of the seabed is left for countries to agree on bilateral basis. The Caspian Sea has rich biodiversity with 125 species of marine and land mammals, 133 species of fish, 144 bird species, and 90% of the world's sturgeon fish stock. But human activity has had a regrettable role in its plummeting sea levels and the decline of its biodiversity. Синие ра ходили, здесь Каспийский килька, сколько ее было, сейчас вообще этого, даже флота нет, потому что ее толком нет. То есть что-то на нее повлиял, тот же уровень добыча той же нефти. Же... Раньше добывала одна страна совсем, и то в одном месте, в Баку. Сейчас пять стран все добывают. The Caspian Sea guards an abundance of resources 
making it an area highly prone to friction. According to some estimates, it contains 19% of world oil reserves and 45% of world gas reserves. However, leasing grounds for extraction activities are incoherently managed. The Caspian Sea also hosts the highest concentration of petroleum companies in the world. These extraction activities impose a heavy burden of pollution, introducing heavy metals such as nickel, chromium, mercury, cadmium, and a number of other contaminants, slowly sedimenting on its shores. This is partly the result of misaligned interests and flawed logic. The watershed of the Caspian Sea is formed by four river basins along with over 130 rivers flowing into it. The Volga River alone provides about 80% of the fresh water inflow into the Caspian Sea. Urban settlements surrounding the inflowing rivers introduce untreated waters along with agricultural pollutants, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, into the Caspian Sea. Furthermore, demification of the Volga River has drastically affected its sea levels, as well as biodiversity. Weak regulatory framework, outdated infrastructure and lack of coordination prevent effective water management. The transboundary division of the Caspian Sea, over-extraction of natural resources, and the increasing levels of contamination bear close resemblance to the actions that turned Aral Sea into a desert. Caspia Mira introduces a new layer of sovereignty based on the Caspia Sea watershed. The area of the watershed is made up of 204 cities located among seven distinct countries, amounting to a population of about 50 million people and representing 14 ethnic groups. These cities form the Caspia Mira City Union, following internal negotiations as well as agreements with cities' respective national governments. Caspia Mira City Union establishes its governance body through legal agreements granting its sovereignty. Caspia Governing Body is responsible for enforcing legislation, implementing decisions and policies, ensuring that all agreements are respected, and overseeing intermarriage affairs, as well as managing, allocating, and prioritizing Caspia Mira Fund. Petroleum companies with an interest in Caspian Sea are required to join Caspia Mira Oil and Gas Extraction Association, responsible for ensuring environmental standards in extraction activities. Licensing payments are collected by the Mira Fund. Different types of contracts are applicable for the extraction activity, including concession agreements, production sharing agreements, and service contracts. Oil and gas profits are shared between Caspia Mira and the oil companies, with pre-existing licenses can maintain their activities if they join the association. Extraction license is tied to water quality standards. Companies are collectively responsible for ensuring high environmental standards through their activities and managing the maintenance of the water quality. Water quality is monitored through in-situ monitoring and remote sensing technology with a set of specific indicators. Caspia Mira operates with a composite basket-based currency used as an electronic unit of account and manages its own fund. The Caspia Mira fund is composed of taxes, fees, and other payments 
collected from petroleum companies operating within Caspia. The Miera Fund is redistributed to the cities based on their carbon footprint reductions and their energy efficiency indicators. These measures are differentiated according to baseline conditions. A portion of money gained by a city is then transferred to its respective national government. Emission reduction incentives encourage cities to adopt urban densification measures, which in turn free land for conservation, agriculture and for rewilding, as well as allocation of renewable energy infrastructure. The Caspian Mira implements incentives to stimulate a transition towards renewable energy, including tax exemptions for companies CO2 emission reduction requirements, alternative energy use incentives, and renewable energy investments promotion. Mira residents enjoy free and unrestricted movements. Work permits for outer Mira residents are granted based on skills and labor priorities. A common visa policy is applied. Mira provides the identification cards issued by the resident city valid and harmonized throughout the Mera. The citizens of nation states overlapping with the Mera free movement zone can move freely within the Mera territory overlapping their nation states. A Mera cannot be considered an isolation but must account for impacts across the different Meras as elements from one will always cross over to another. Mirrors of set and pay compensations for negative externalities imposed onto one another. Each mirror publicly displays its environmental data. Compensations are allocated to the mirror funds, thus building incentives for further reduction of negative externalities. All right, we're back. Um, so thank you. Our, our final project that we will present uh, today on the first day of the, of the 2019 Neuro Normal Project Showcase is Current. One of the, uh, in addition to the educational program, one of the really uh, important parts of the Strelke Institute initiative is, uh, is the publishing initiative. And earlier this year, uh, we published a quite amazing book, actually probably my favorite book of, of last year by our friends uh, Matty Haven, that was about 
many uh, about among many other things um, mobile cinema or perhaps rather what happens when cinema becomes mobile or rather when mobility becomes cinematic and especially what sorts of time this draws out I hope that's fair so in relation to the city we might we may normally think of cinema as a kind of building uh, a big camera obscura that you enter with a paid ticket and watch images on the far wall but the relation between cinema and the city is always changing uh, and the relation is always historically fraught Walter Benjamin compared films to cities and in doing so described architecture as a distracted medium. Since then, various prophets against the spectacle denounced the impact of the image on urban psychology. Sometimes though, we get cinematic works that inquire into the potential future of cinema itself as, through asking the question, what might be the relationship between that future cinema and the city. For example, in 1989, um, having been given an early digital video camera, Wim Wenders made the film Notebook on Cities and Clothes. This was a different kind of camera, one based not on a strip, but on a chip. What would be its new relationship to the city, he asked. It's a good question to ask about this new thing, a digital camera. His answer is that it would be about clothing. You would wear the city through the digital cinema and vice versa. And so he took his new camera to interview Yoji Yamamoto, who knew a lot about wearing things. And we do, in fact, wear our cinema now in the city, as the city, in our hand or on our face. This next project, Current, is also cinema about the future of cinema. A work that tries to visualize, not to try to visualize the future in general, as sci-fi movies might, but the moving image visualizing its own future as the moving image. Today, however, the new camera is the new chip that is up in the cloud. Massive GPU render farms making cinema over there that we see over here. But Vendor's question remains, what is the relationship between this new cinema and the city? So maybe think of what you see here as something like uh, YouTube 2025. It will be a convergence of four key plateauing trends, as they will explain. First, of live streaming, how people and things perform real-time feeds demonstrating their identity and reality. Second, a volumetric cinema, like for video games, for perhaps VR, where navigation through space takes over from the edited cut to structure film form. Third, artificial intelligence, how GP, uh, uh, GPUs making new images out of the raw goop of digital bits. Maybe fake, maybe not, maybe deep, maybe not but AI authored for sure. And finally, a, and a pers personalization. Finally, as the cinema is produced in real time, it is just for you. There is only one movie. The only movie is the one that you want to watch right now. So here is one movie's idea about what that movie will look like, current. Hi, um, I'm Provides, I'm an architect from Hong Kong. Hi, I'm Mary, an art director and designer from Moscow. Hi, I'm Yanzi, an artist. Hi, uh, I'm Eli Jotiva, I'm an artist from Bulgaria uh, and I'm based in Los Angeles. And we are the current team. We would like to introduce you to a speculation on the future of broadcasting cinema. To do this, we will present two films one comprised of our research, and the second one, a more experiential 
a design proposal for what this cinematic experience might look and feel like. In order to redefine a cinema, we first take a brief look at the history of cinema. We take into great consideration of the Russian history of cinema. First, the one take, no cut of the Lumiere Brother production. Second, the montage of the Russian experiments. Third, especially the expanded cinema movement from the 60s. We are taking those ideologies, incorporating them into our four core ideas. First, AI optimization. Second, infinite live stream. Third, photometric cinema. And fourth, personalization. So our project depicts how these interact. With the invention of live stream, we collected a lot of mundane moments, and it allows everyone to be a producer. It collapses the line of authorship between viewer and producer. With volumetric cinema, it enables us to collect all those data and depict it in a 3D space, shifting from a traditional frame to frame into a world-to-world -world navigation of nonlinear narrators. And at the same time, AI optimization recommend contents and mesh them together, project it to you. This gives us our fourth idea of personalization. So with this, we present to you first our research video. Please enjoy. Did you know that there are 13 million people streaming their lives right now? The self-streaming culture in Asia is exponentially growing, with hundreds of streaming agencies hiring broadcasters to form through their virtual audiences, often augmenting bodies in real time. On a city scale, there are more than 350 million video surveillance cameras worldwide, recording petabyte footage every day. In the wild, hundreds of cameras are placed in remote environments and on endangered animals, observing the landscape and their inhabitants. Meanwhile, in outer space, NASA's International Space Station streams and views the Earth in real time at all times. Access to these streams has transformed the moving image into an endless current that a user can step in and out of at any time. This live streaming condition extends the human eye into inaccessible environments and non-human perspectives, all within the immediacy of the present moment. In the lineage of expanded cinema, Current asks, what may a form of expanded streaming look and feel like? The outsourcing of imagination to artificial intelligence can most readily be observed in the cultural phenomenon of generative adversarial networks and deep fakes. These neural networks work in binary manners. The former works through competing data sets, the latter in collaborative encoding. Both mechanisms recompose visuals by combining multiple data inputs and have the potential to generate infinitely long takes which redefine the cinematic cut. As GANs shift to include three-dimensional inputs, they add a z-depth to the geometry and introduce hyper-real volumetric simulations of reality. Neural networks are being trained to simulate and reinvent time-based moving images by content mashups, introducing potent cultural ambiguities around the questions of authenticity. At the same time, they redefine the role of movie directors, collapsing pre-production with post-production, transforming cinema into an information-based transference. Within a live stream context, algorithms are capable of finding events within non-events, collapsing significant moments with the mundane and predicting outcomes. Current imagines how time might collapse based on viewers' engagement with AI-generated content and thus form an algorithmically infused cinematic vocabulary. The contemporary advent of new sensing technologies is shifting the current state of visual content to include three dimensions. Through remote satellites, we have transitioned from viewing the Earth from a planar map to a three-dimensional globe. Depth LiDAR sensors and motion trackers used in cinema, virtual reality, and gaming industries have transformed the cinematic language of navigation into an editing technique. Instead of pre-cut-to-cut montage, we now experience navigation-based world-to-world transitions, where spaces get constructed through a recursive interaction between the virtual space and the user's real-time navigation and attention. 
the transition from two to three dimensions has enriched the image with more information. Currently, all images and videos produced are embedded with spatial metadata. Photogrammetry reconstructions and LiDAR scans of environments can be localized to GPS-specific points. When coupled with multiple real-time cameras and sensor inputs of the same location, the informationally rich space of volumetric construction can provide decentralized perspectives to events. Vision mechanisms of self-driving cars already use real-time collaborative vision to cross-check what they perceive with each other. Within the framework of volumetric attention-based navigation, Current speculates on the potential of this type of collaborative vision to authenticate truth for users. 400 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute, and 1 billion hours of video are being watched every day. In order to optimize content suggestion in YouTube, Google's deep learning research team produced the largest scale industrial recommendation system in existence. Algorithmic personalization of content is present in most online platforms and impression-based advertising mechanisms like Google Ads. Users' search engine history, viewing data, and banking statements are all taken into account by these algorithms. Netflix takes user interactions, title ratings, and viewing history to categorize users into global communities with similar tastes and preferences. Current anticipates that the future of algorithmic curation of content will be linked not only to a user's archive database, but also to their real-time biometric data inputs. For example, detection of a user's gaze during a specific environment allows the system to prioritize and optimize similar content for their own non-linear narrative. With such a personalized current, curated based on our embodied experiences, we may no longer want to sit in an audience with 50 other people watching the same exact content. We have not ended. So with the research video, we showed you what happened now. And with the next speculative film, we hope to depict the future of how we perceive it. Um, with this open source cinema, we, we try to depict what current takes as its currency, which is a micro, distributed micro value transaction where attention, gaze, truth, and affect takes as its core values. So we will now pr premiere our film. Um, in it, you will see a real-time personal exper personalized experience for multiple users generated from artificially constructed environments, volumetric depth cameras, deep fakes, and hundreds of live streams. So enjoy the real-time current. Thank <laughs> you. 
开放的中国加速度，看到了将改革开放进行到底的中国决心。我们改革的脚步不会停滞，开放的大门只会越开越大。很多港澳台居民拿到了居住证，香港进入了全国高铁网，一个流动的中国。充满了繁荣发展的活力。无论国际风云如何变幻，中国维护国家主权和安全的信心和决心不会变；中国维护世界和平、促进共同发展的诚意和善意不会变。我们将积极推动共建“一带一路”，继续推动构建人类命运共同体，为建设一个更加繁荣美好的世界而不懈努力。